Welcome to episode 131 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. When I started doing these episodes, um, I, I reached out to a few people uh, who I wanted to take this journey with me. One of them was Joseph Malazzi, and uh, he's followed me through this thing from beginning to end. And we are here for the last installment of the, the core content that I set out to create specifically with him, which is uh, his final season of uh, Stargate, so far, Stargate Universe Season 2. <laughs> And we have a wonderful guest, uh, in addition to that, in the form of Paul Molly. Now, this was the other thing that I was hoping for from the beginning of the show, eventually having one of uh, both of them on at the same time, and we have achieved that in this episode. They are both here live, so I am thrilled. So before we get into the thick of things, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this to continue to be produced here on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you hit that like button. It will make a difference and help the show grow its audience further. We're already at 20,000. Let's see where it goes next. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend, and if you want to be notified about future episodes, click that subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops, and you'll get my notifications of any last-minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few uh, weeks on GateWorld.net and later on on Dial the Gate in the summer during the summer hiatus. As with most of our shows, this is a live stream, which means that if you are at YouTube.com slash Dial the Gate, my moderating team, Summer and Tracy, are standing by there to take your questions for Joe and Paul. The first half of the episode will be me talking with them, uh, uh, getting Paul caught up about what we've done, getting his insights about the franchise, and, and both of their insights about Stargate Universe and closing this chapter of their lives. And uh, then, in the second half of the show, we'll bring your questions in. So without further ado, enough of me babbling along. Joseph Malazzi, writer and executive producer, Stargate Universe, and Paul Mully, writer and executive producer, Star well, actually, of Stargate Atlantis and SG-1, not of Universe. Is that correct, guys? It or were you executive producers nope. on Universe We were as well? executive producers. Second yeah. season. Yeah. Second, Second season. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's it. Executive producers all. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Paul, welcome hey. to Dial the Gate. Glad to be here. Thank you so it, much. Um, I have to say, this is going to be very exciting for me because, you know, we put out the tweet and on Facebook. And of course, you know, fans who may have sort of come across it, seen the, these two young dynamic writers, these up and comers, that picture, hungry up that and picture comers. Was awesome. and, uh, and, and thought, wow, you know, I, I got to get, you know, so some questions here. Here's some insights from these uh, for these young guys. There, you guys are. There's only so many photos of the two of you who are, are mm. available on. I, I, Joe, I reached. I didn't have direct line of communication with Paul. And I reached out to Joe. And I said, "Is there a, a like a headshot of Paul that we can exist?" And he's like, that, "That we can that I can use." It's like, well, go online. <laughs> so, yeah. so I did. They, I they, found one. Yeah. They took pictures of us like the first season. The, the publicity people were like, "We should take pictures of you." Or like, "Why? We're the writers. Who cares?" And then that was it. That was the only time they ever did it, I think. I think that's from like season one or maybe two. I mean, season four for us, season one. Well, for I would us, assume from four. Dark Matter, you guys would have like something. He he probably does. I, I, oh, I, 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 mean, I don't know. Not really even. Yeah, not nobody really. nobody ever wanted to take our picture. They, they yeah. want pictures of the cast. Shameful. They don't want pictures of us. Really? You know, it, it is a shame because I remember all the times that Darren and I went to the office and it's like, I don't think we ever asked to take pictures with the... Mm -hmm. And in and, and hindsight, it's, 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 a, it's a genuine travesty, you know? Like Joel Goldsmith, I had one picture that I, that I took with him and I can't find it. And he's gone now. Yeah. You know? And it's like, you know what? son of a... I agree. I agree with you because I never took pictures with people, with the cast or with the crew or whatever. I, I was never a, a, like that kind of guy. Like, hey, let's take a selfie or whatever, right. you know? And now I regret it. Now I wish I had those pictures. I just, I just never did it, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's... Talk about further regrets, including the end <laughs> of Stargate Universe and what we would have done in season three and beyond. I'm most I'm mostly <laughs> mm -hmm. kidding, of course. Joe, um, before we get really into that, though, um, tell me about uh, meeting Paul. Uh, we met in a creative writing class, a college creative writing class, and we had a mutual friend. And apparently, the mutual friend told him, warned him about me and said, he's pretty weird. And, fair and enough, very fair, very fair. Yeah. 
Yeah. What 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 was oh, weird about Joe? What was weird about Joe at the time mostly was wardrobe related. He had his own, <laughs> he had his own sense of style. This was, you know, sort of we were like 18, 19 years old, and he was wearing suits to school, like white, like a white suit with like a black tie, and like, and like I was like, oh my, like Mr. Rourke or something. Not a and, smudge and, on it, I'm sure. <laughs> and like weird, like Mandarin collars and stuff like that, and and uh, and so yeah, I was like, okay, this is an interesting dude, but whatever. Yeah, it was ironically creative writing class, which is yep. strange in a way. And I then guess. that evolved from uh, creative writing to Dungeons and Dragons uh, yeah. to to eventually uh, co-writing. Right. Wait, you guys and, played Dungeons and Dragons together? Oh, yeah, sure. I never knew that. Yeah. yeah. How yeah. awesome. His, uh, yeah. He uh, had a, uh, what was it, a, a, a monk, Cato? Cato? Yeah, the monk, yeah, yeah. He was like a martial monk. arts dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mine, mine was a, a goblin fighter with a, an 18 charisma. <laughs> didn't you name your, didn't you name your company after uh, your, the, the, Mursiam, yes, Mursiam, right? Mursiam, as, as, against an, uh, after an NPC, yeah. Oh, oh, I thought it was yeah. one of your characters. No, I was just actually a, uh, an NPC villain. Oh, okay. Appropriately. <laughs> and then that moved into um, somehow forming this partnership. I mean, hmm. Paul, well, where, how, how do I, you make the leap from Dungeons & Dragons to that? I can tell you exactly how. Okay, so he was always interested. Well, we were both interested in writing. We did meet in writing class. But I... I, I swear to God, this is true. I never thought of scripts as like movies or TV as being something that was written. Like it just never even occurred to me. Writing to me was writing prose. It was writing, uh, you know, uh, short stories or novels or whatever. And we both tried that. And, you know, we did that for a while. But then Joe out of the blue said, I'm going to write a script. Actually, he had written a novel and then he turned it into a script, right? That's yeah, what yeah. happened. Basically, uh, the, the story is I wrote a novel and it was a terrible novel. I remember you reading it. You read it and said, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, you've written better stuff. He goes, and, and, and you said, but I can see this more of a, as a script. So I transformed that terrible novel into an equally terrible script. <laughs> That's but, funny, because I, I remember it the exact opposite. I remember being completely surprised by you taking it, making it a script. Mm -hmm. go, but once he did that, it was like, oh, script writing. That's cool. Mm -hmm. and, and then he got into animation. And- That's right and was making money writing animation. Uh, wow. And he was like, you should try it. And so we had a mutual friend, um, what was his name? What was it? Was it Thomas? Thomas. Thomas Lapierre was was his boss at, at Cinar, the animation company where he was working and he needed writers. So he gave me Thomas's number and I phoned him up and then I started writing for them. And then somewhere along the way, while we were doing this, we had an idea for, for a feature that we co-wrote because I started to write that and I had no idea what I was doing. And I got like 10 pages into it. And I'm like, I don't know how to write a feature. This was even before the animation, I think. And so I gave it to him. I'm like, can you work on this? <laughs> uh, we had never really we had never really worked together before that yeah. time. And so he, he was like, yeah, this is a good idea. And so he worked on it. We tossed it back and forth. And we, it never got made. But it did get us eventually through this really torturous route of various people who had it. Uh, our agent. Carl Lieberman, and uh, and one day Carl phoned us and said, uh, "There's these guys on this science fiction show in Vancouver who need writers. Uh, do you want to pitch for them?" And we had actually pitched Outer Limits, okay, uh, years years before. And the irony is that Brad was, I think it was the executive producer of Outer Limits mm -hmm. at that point. I don't know, mm -hmm. but the pitch never went to him. It went to Trilogy, the production, the, right. one of their companies that was that was overseeing it. And years later, we told him this story and we, we told him the pitches and he was like, I would have I would have bought those pitches, but he never even saw them. They never even got. Wow. to Wow. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, we did pitch at uh, Stargate and they liked some of our pitches. And I think we wrote an it was like this whole test period, right? Like you write an outline and then if your outline doesn't absolutely suck, then you get to write a first draft. And if your first draft doesn't absolutely suck. And we just kept, you know, making these hurdles. And then eventually they were like, do you want to move to Vancouver for six months? Six, it was supposed to be six months, I believe. Mm -hmm. The first. The final time. season. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Season four, that's it. You know, six months, you're done. And season and, five and, was, was greenlit at that point. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. But we didn't, but we weren't. Oh, you know, we I get were, it. They, we didn't know that they were, they were going to hire us back. Right. right? Of In course. Fact, you're you're probably, being tested. I think we. Mm -hmm. probably assumed we weren't going to go. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> and, you know, I never left. That was 22 years ago, and I never left.
Now, Joe had mentioned to me in a previous uh, conversation that you guys had these garbage dump theater nights where Stargate was one of the shows that came across the the screen at one point where you guys you guys watched some movies that were not always considered the top shelf. Yeah, I mean well, they were kind of they were kind of fair? what's the what's the term? Uh, um, guilty pleasures, maybe I don't know. Yeah, what, what would we call it? Bad movie. It was called right. Bad Movie Night. It was called yeah, Bad Movie Night. So we saw Barbed Wire. Okay. Yep. Um, Color of Night with Bruce Willis. Yeah, that um, was a good one. That, I remember that one. That was uh, intense. Battlefield Earth. Uh, Boxing oh. Helena. Oh, I was going to say, what was the one where she wound up with no yeah, arms? Yeah. yeah, Boxing Helena was, was <laughs> probably the worst. Yeah. And was Stargate and, one of them? I feel like that's not very fair to Stargate. That, no, it, but I mean, the fact was we heard it was a bomb. Right. And then we went oh, to right. check it out. And it turned out... To not be a bomb is actually a pretty yeah, good movie. Right. But then when we came on the show, we didn't know the show. It was they were they had done three seasons. I hadn't seen it. And I'll never forget it. They sent us the Bible and it was this bigger sketch. than the Bible. It, yeah, bigger than yeah. the actual Bible was the joke <laughs> that 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 we made. Because in only three seasons, they had developed so much mythology right. that it, it was overwhelming. And and of course, little did we know we were gonna take that and go way 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 further um, but it. yeah but it was intense and like I'm, i was like i can't read through this thing so we just I'll, i just skimmed it <laughs> and we watched episodes uh you know you watch episodes you watch the pilot and we watched a few other episodes just to get the feel right the the voice what the tone you know that kind of thing and and just kind of went from there but it was intimidating coming coming on that show yeah for sure did you ever feel like I can't do another season of this, you know, all the time. Please let it be the last one. <laughs> no. no, I wouldn't say please let it be the last one. We want to keep doing it. Right. Whether we thought we could. Okay. Was like, we're out of ideas. We, if season five, we're like, we're done. We're out. This is, we can't do any more of this. Well, it was the end of season four. I remember you coming into my office and saying, this is it. We, we've come up with all the ideas. If we can, <laughs> no more. You know, I don't know how we do this again next year. Jeez. And it becomes this thing that changes your lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. Completely. Let's uh, uh, take a step forward um, past Atlantis. Stargate Universe, Paul, has has now been on the air for, for one season. Uh, evidently, Sci-Fi had greenlit two seasons out of the gate, which is my understanding, but it wasn't that public knowledge. They wanted to see how it was going to do. They didn't want fans to just kind of, ah, I'll see it when it's done. Um, second season comes along. Uh, what were your impressions for what Brad wanted to do for for this second chapter of the show and where this thing was going? As um, he, he's checking his database here. So. I'm getting my cheat sheet going. Yeah. Um, yeah. See, when you guys talk about like when were we greenlit for the next season and that all of that that really I don't remember those details. Yeah. Like when we when we were writing this, did we know this was going to happen? And yeah. and that's kind of a blur for me. Um, I guess, I guess, were we two seasons greenlit from the beginning? No, we had no. to hit a certain number okay. to get oh, the right. second season yes. greenlit. Right. And then right, right, on right, right, average, right. we did. But we knew before we wrote the end of season one that we were coming back. Yes. Or, yeah. 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 I think we were pretty um, sure. So for, well, for me, because of, of where we left off, it was just, we need to keep going, right? Like you can't leave off where we left off. Right. right? So, exactly. So. And, and that's, this is a perennial challenge every year on Stargate. This was a challenge. It was a challenge on dark matter. It's, it's, when do you know, you know, if, or if you think, well, we might get canceled at the end of this, you, right. you ideally want to know because you want to end on a cliffhanger, right? Right. Um, uh, to get people excited about the next season. Exactly. Uh, but you don't want to end like this is what happened to us on dark matter and we're still bitter about it right you don't want to ha end on a in the middle literally in the middle of a huge cliffhanger and never get to pay it off right so so for me d d season two of universe was just it didn't feel like season two to me it was just we're just we're just going to keep going this the continuation is, this, of the story we're, yeah there's mm -hmm. stories okay. we need to be telling here well i mean you know that's what we did and and so i was very excited for the opportunity to keep doing that show okay what did you think um, was special about Universe compared to the content that came before? Set, setting, cast? 
all i mean yeah everything was very different it was it you know we completely reset and and it took a different approach to almost everything we took a different approach to the way we shot it the way we lit it uh the set obviously was you guys talked about it in your last episode it was incredible um um, but from a writer standpoint, what it really was, was the way it was written was the way, uh, it, you know, it was darker. We've, we've, you guys talked about that. It was definitely darker. It was more about the interaction. A lot of the conflict came in interaction between the characters as opposed from, from outside, which, you know, was the old Stargate, <clears throat> um, uh, SG one in Atlantis was more about people attacking us from the outside and the group, the core group is getting along for the most part you know, maybe needling each other or whatever. And there's a lot of humor and stuff in that, but, but the conflict is coming from outside, not from within. And SG was, there was conflict coming from outside, but there was plenty more coming from within, from within the group of people. Um, so that was a whole, it was fun to be able to do that for a change, but not to disrespect the way the other shows were written. I love, right. I love those shows, but from a, from a creative standpoint, it was nice to, to, to try something different in that regard. Joe, season two for you, before we get into the, the individual episodes, what were you excited about continuing or getting started with? Um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer okay. that question. I mean, no, he fairly sums it up. I okay. mean, uh, you know, after, what was it like? This was our 12th season. A lot. On on the franchise. I mean, it, it just, yeah. it's, it's it's like a yeah, machine, like right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, I mean, considerable. Yeah, and and he's right. It does it does kind of feel like you're on a treadmill sometimes, like like you, or you're feeding a, a a a machine that that's rolling in front of you, and you can't mm. slow down. Like it just the machine keeps going, and there's no time for you to stop. So creatively, it can get tiring. Uh, and like I said, we thought we thought we were out of ideas in season five, right? <laughs> so so you're under a lot of pressure to constantly be coming. And you know, we're not alone. Obviously, we had a great writers' right. room, and and we're bouncing ideas off of each other all the time, and and but i there was something refreshing for the in that regard about having a new style of writing to do it's still the stargate franchise we're still honoring the franchise as much as we can but it's a different type of writing and and i think that got, gave it gave me anyway a, a a kind of a new energy so intervention starts off the season the crew gets kicked off the ship um we, we think that the Lucian Alliance have, have gained uh, control. We have a great uh, B-plot in the form of TJ going on what she perceives to be a journey back to the planet from season one, the Obelisk world. And we later find out in the season that it's the ship that's trying to, or so we think at this point, it's the ship that's trying to console the crew at this point and get them into fighting shape so that they can be prepared for the mission that uh, they're going to take on. Whatever, you know, they're going to face, they have to be in a certain mindset to do it. And I think intervention was really establishing that. Joe, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, the challenge, really the biggest challenge going into that episode was the TJ pregnancy. And, and you know, as, as I pointed out in previous episodes, uh, at this point in our careers, Paul and I were writing, even though we were sharing um, uh, credits, uh, we were writing scripts separately for the most part. And this one was, uh, his, okay. The, the, the premiere and the challenge he had, and he'll speak to that was how to deal with the baby. Like you didn't want, I mean, the thought of, of raising a child on the ship just seemed so, you know, beyond dark. But then again, having her lose the baby was equally dark. And so it fell on Paul to come up with a solution. And I remember um, Robert Carlyle coming up to the office and, and saying, this is fucking brilliant after reading the script. <laughs> Paul? Well, it, he's right. I mean, there was 100% about, not that it was brilliant. Uh, well, <laughs> it was okay. It was okay brilliant. Um, but no, I mean... Um, uh, right about the challenge uh, of, of pregnancy. And we had done this before, right? We'd been down this road before on both, on, on both, S like, you know, Amanda got pregnant on Stargate and of course Rachel got pregnant. So it's like, you've got two and choices. Claudia. You can e yep, you can either play it or you can shoot around it, right? And and sometimes shooting around it, it works. Uh, it's it's hard, but you can sort of do it, especially if you can write the actor actress out 
for a certain number, like with, like we did with Rachel uh, for a while, you know, oh, she's kidnapped. We, you know, she's somewhere else. <laughs> right. Um, but there was nowhere for TJ to go. And once the baby was there, there was nowhere for the baby to go. Right. Like it's destiny was it's, you know, this enclosed environment. So there's, and there's not very many people. And like Joe said, it was such a dark environment. It's like, you can't have a baby here, but you also don't want this grim ending to the episode. So yeah, we came up with that idea and I think it was, I thought it was beautiful. I, 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 I really, the end of that, I don't mm. remember who was it, if it was actually my idea for that nebula, maybe it was, mm. I don't remember. Um, but we needed something. We needed some glimmer of hope at the end of that episode, not just for her, but for the whole, for the, everyone else on board and for the audience. Like it, it was just, it was going to be too. What I don't remember, and Joe, maybe you can speak to this. I don't think that we knew that it was the ship at that time. Like we had not decided that this, we had, we had sort of left it yeah. open in our own minds, whether this was real or not. Yeah, I, uh, I, and, I think so. So when, uh, whatever it was called, when they came back, that then we made that commitment. And even, then, even at the end of that, you can kind of still argue it's still not 100% really clear. Um, no, I agree. I think it's so, the obelisk aliens. So Whoever anyway, they were, they were pushing the balls around. What? Yeah. So <laughs> in my mind, you know, I didn't want to kill the baby. Right. Uh, so, uh, and you know, but like we, like Joe said, we couldn't have that baby around. So we had to do something. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, you know, some shows cheat, right? Like, like yeah. remember, remember Ross and Rachel, they had a baby and like within, within two weeks, they're like, where's the baby? Ah, she's with her grandparents she's at the nineties, whatever <laughs> they they just stopped dealing with it and yeah. uh, and we didn't have that option on that ship there was nowhere to go so so we had to deal with it. this i think was a good solution honestly and it gave elena something really wonderful to play i agree yeah that girl man can she act holy cow she's wonderful what an she's wonderful and 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 as i was going through like you know, i was watching these you know to, to brush up for this i had to had to rem get my memory going so i watched some of these episodes rewatched them and you know what i remember what i think mo most about sgu is is the moments where i was on set with actors who were reading well, my dialogue because that's when i was usually on right. set if i was the set producer um and just taking it to a, a level that you write it and you think this is going to be good i hope but then you see it on its feet with actors playing it. And we had, we had such a great cast and, and they would just, and she was just writing the stuff that I, reading the stuff that I had written, playing it. And just, I was so proud. I was so, it was so moving to watch her do that stuff. Joe? Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, you know, I think back to Elena especially and, and her casting and you know, they, they, we loved her, and for some reason, there was a resistance on the part of of um, uh, the network because I think they wanted someone else. And, I don't remember. Yeah, at the very beginning, and Brad went to bat, and he's like, "No, this is this is who we want," and 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 uh, you know, he was proven right. She she was excellent. She's excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, what was what was really lovely about Elena was she had no process, or at least it wasn't visible to me. So she would be a completely normal person. She would be Elena talking, chatting with you. And then we, they would go, okay, they need you on set. And she would go on to set and just instantly be in this, because I was writing some fairly intense stuff for her, just instantly be there with like tears in her eyes and just really mm -hmm. incredible intensity. And then she'd come off the set and she'd say, okay, I'll see you later. Wow. Like a, a lot of actors, you know, they really have to work themselves. Not, not that there's anything wrong with this, but they have to work themselves up for stuff like that. And to me, it, at least it seemed on the outside to me that it was effortless for her, which was incredible. Just, I'm sure it wild. wasn't, but it, it looked that way, which was amazing. Awakening, uh, the next episode here, which the you, that you guys did, which is one of my favorites because it introduces a couple of, of great elements, the seed ships yeah. and the the Ursini, or as, as uh, Mark Savella called him, Fred. Um, <laughs> this was a, a really cool show because it's, it's starting to establish, you know, the mythology of what was, or help establish the mythology of what was going on and, and how it was done. We got our peak at seeing a Stargate manufacturing plant, 
Yeah, that was cool. I still regret that we didn't see more of. Um, but it was cool. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, now see how the, you know, how the sausage is made. Um, and it uh, gave us a solution for um, uh, Lou Diamond Phillips for, for being uh, on the show. We had to put him away somewhere for a few episodes, but he's still, like, out in the universe. So at least he's on our side of uh, uh, the, the cosmos. Uh, Joe, you want to speak to that? Or was uh, was this your episode now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. the thing I remember most about this episode was how tiny or narrow that set was. Yes. Just yeah. see, it was as Andy uh, Makita directing. And because the set was built for the height of these aliens, the ceiling was very low. The uh, quarters were not very wide. And there were certain, you know, I, I was amazed that uh, the camera guy was, was able to get through uh, certain recesses. Um, but I think that's the best. not a passenger ship. Right, right. Yeah. I think that was the idea. I think, as I recall, it was somebody said, it may have been Brad or somebody said, the idea is they're inside a machine, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, mm -hmm. like you said, it's not a passenger ship. It's not really designed for people. Uh, it's it's an automated ship, basically, that just pumps out. It, yeah. You've got Jeffrey had... tubes and that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so, legit. Yeah. It was very cool. And I think the best thing to come out of this episode was. Uh, I can't believe they did this, but Mark Savella and the visual effects team created a blooper with Lou Diamond Phillips and, <laughs> oh, right. and the alien. I forgot about that. Was included, yeah, in the yes, special features. Absolutely. Where I think the alien, like they're, they're just talking between setups and uh, <laughs> Lou tells the alien a, a joke. Balls. Yeah. <laughs> no, we just released, we released it on Dial the Gate and uh, hmm. yeah, it's a hoot. It's, it's really great. Awakenings um, uh, introduced the Ursini. They would come into play uh, later on in the season. I don't think, I'm not sure if we even saw them again, but the visual effects in this episode with the Nakai in season one and with these guys, man, oh man, you created believable aliens. And it, it, it's there's a story purpose for it because this far out in the universe, the ancients never had a chance mm -hmm. to muck around or put DNA out there. So there's no humans. So what you're going to see... <laughs> is legitimately aliens, which I'm sure you guys wanted to, to do in in universe. Am I right, Paul? Yeah, I mean, with, that was a that was a discussion from the very beginning when they were Brad and Robert were coming up from the original concept of the show. We were like, well, wait a minute. You under you know that there's not going to be any other people out there, right? Like right. if you're going to do aliens, they're going to have to be alien. But the visual effects had evolved to the point where we were fairly confident we weren't going to have them running around all the time because it's it's bloody expensive but but the quality would be there that that we would be able to get glimpses of full cg aliens um you know because there was no other that it was of necessity once when you when you take the concept and you know right away okay if we're going to see aliens they're going to be and we you know we weren't going to do rubber masks and right. and uh so yeah, it was part of it was baked in from to the concept from the beginning. And then we when we finally got to see it, it was pretty cool. Legit trial and error um, destiny or whatever this thing is that's that's uh, uh, communicating with them out there is running him through drills, um, almost like Kobayashi Maru's one after the other. Yeah. Um, and getting him in basically his mind in shape to get over the awful thing that he had done to Sergeant Riley. Um, I'll let people look that up. Uh, <laughs> and getting him basically in fighting shape to take command, to man up and, you know, and, and become the leader that he was born to be. You know, mm -hmm. this, I, I love this episode because, um, well, not, I mean, not only does uh, uh, Louis Ferreira do an amazing job performing in this, but it brings out, begins to bring out the promise of the character to uh, the audience, which is that, you know, he was placed in this situation. He's got his own load of baggage, but you know what? He's got to set those things aside and begin to uh, take care of the people and the mission who are involved. Who who wants to, to speak to this? Is this, uh, is, is this uh, yours, Paul? Well, the, the this was a Paul Molly joint. I, I will point out, though, also that um, there's a terrific scene between Brian and Louie 
is this the episode I think where where yeah, it, where yeah. where Scott you know challenges his and get gets in his face and, and pushes him up against the wall and I remember uh Brian who played Scott uh you know when we we cast him fresh out of Juilliard yeah being so excited about this scene like more than I'd ever seen him excited about playing a scene on on uh on the show's run so, so this was an example of what I talked about before where what I remember most and the, the impression I get like when I think back on Stargate Universe was those moments where I was watching actors do scenes that I had written and just taking it to a, because because we were writing like I said the writing was way more intense right there was way more intense emotional stuff uh, um, than there had been on the in the previous incarnations of the show uh, and so it was a new experience for me to, to write stuff like that and then go and see actors uh, play it and this episode was all that <laughs> it was it right. was in, there was a lot of intensity going on uh, I told Louis like right b before we even started shooting I think I was like you know you're gonna get beaten up in this I mean emotionally like be well literally and figuratively beaten up in this episode he's he, he had to he's got to work his ass off in this episode um, and he just you know bit into it and, and did an amazing, amazing job but yeah this was one of those episodes where I was like oh man <laughs> We're gonna put the actors through the ringer on this one, and and let's see what they can do. And it was just so wonderful. That's the scene you're talking about is one of my favorite scenes that I've ever written, actually, because I I we and we had seeded it by so slowly seeing him kind of decline mm -hmm. in previous episodes. He was drinking a lot, mm -hmm. and 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 it, we we had to have it come to a head at some point. And he had been under so much pressure from the very beginning. He, he always had one of Telf his guys. You know, he, he always had Telford in his mind. So yeah. yeah, he always had people saying you weren't the right guy for this job and blah, 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 wasn't supposed to be you. And, and, and so, yeah. And then he had to killing Riley, you know, that was a whole other <laughs> can of worms. I mean, that was, a, that was an incredible scene too. Oh, um, gosh. And, and it's like, television he, to watch. yeah. So it, you have to do something with that, right? You can't yeah. just have him go back to being a normal guy, right? Like, like that was the, that was the show, right? They were showing the actual emotional consequences of some of the crazy stuff that they were going through. And letting the actors play it so that was the idea behind this i i don't remember joe and i had been pitching like ships sort of remotely communicating inside people's heads for long for a long time we had lots of different stargaters ideas over the years mm -hmm. that were basically that that the ship a ship whatever whatever ship we might be on is sort of an artificial intelligence but can't communicate like just by talking to you but sort of gets in your head and affects your brain waves essentially and gives you can give you dreams or illusions or make you see things or hear things or whatever we've been toying with ideas like that for a long time back and forth and then i don't remember at what point we kind of brad or whoever said yeah the destiny can do that i don't i don't or we pitched it or i don't, I don't remember it it's, it was another one of those ideas that sort of had evolved for a long time but we always love those kind of scenarios where you can see you know something incredible happen uh and then you get you get to do stuff like like blow uh scott out the out the ship right know, space, through the observation you know? lounge yeah so so those kinds of episodes allow you to do stuff like that and that actually that moment is what also another thing i will never forget i will never forget brian doing that stunt the ratchet uh, yeah the ratchet because we were in the effects stage and the they, they determined the visual effects people were and and the stunt people as well were like the best way to get the great body language is to actually pull him up so he was hanging he was like he looked like Tom Cruise in you know in Mission Impossible. He was hanging <laughs> on this thing, uh, with the camera under him, looking up at him. So he's here, and then it was just he just went up to the ceiling, and I remember he said it wasn't scary. I mean, he went high, like yeah. it was a high ceiling. He wasn't scary. The pull wasn't scary, but at the top, he it kind of went, it kind of bounced him down, like it went up to the top and then it went like that, and then he hung there. And he said that was the scary part because it because he sort of had this moment of free fall and, he was like, ah! <laughs> and then they lowered him down i'll never forget it that was that was a that was an incredible day the scene that i i'm not sure if it's in this episode or in a or in a subsequent episode it may be in a subsequent episode but the scene that really comes out to me um is uh from that's really starts off in this in this episode is where young goes back to the ioa and they're pushing him around and I don't know if you guys recall this, but they're like, okay, we, we need you to do X, Y, and Z, and you're going to do it. And he basically tells them, go to hell. Mm -hmm. um, these are my people. 
this is what we're doing. Uh, and if I if we choose to stop talking to you, we will. So you're playing this on our terms. And it was one of those situations where it's like, uh, you know, I Jack O'Neill is on one side of that argument, essentially. And then you've got you've got Young on the other. And I understand them both. Um, but I really got to hand it to Young for standing up and saying, this is my ship. This is my crew. This is what we're going to do. Joe, do you recall that? I do not. Okay. <laughs> Very I, good. I, I do recall. I do recall uh, Rick guest starring. Yes, but uh, I do not. Recall. This, this was the tea. This was the tea bag episode, wasn't it? Was, was it, it? Tea was this a tea bag? There's, there's well, an episode. They, every episode where where Jack is <laughs> drinking something <laughs> out of a mug oh, is the tea bag episode. His finger into the. And like pulls the tea bag out and kind of does that. I, I'm pretty sure he did that in this one. Well, uh, no, in every but in every episode when he's holding a cup, he'll yeah. always at some point near the end look down, reach in and pull something out, and uh, yeah, and they don't even know what it is and yeah. then just kind of throw it away. Yeah, yeah, that it's funny because you know that's the stuff we remember sometimes. We, we should be thinking, <laughs> focusing more on no, on the content of the scene, but but yeah. <laughs> At least something sticks. Yeah. <laughs> Resurgence, the mid-season hmm. two-parter, um, introduces the drones. And this was one of those ideas that carried into the end of uh, the show. It had lasting effects for uh, the outcome of the series. And it was one of these great ideas where um, we have a similar force to the replicators that we can't appeal to. There's no stopping these things. We just, right. we, we can't, mm -hmm. um, we can't out, we can't outrun them. You know, we can't outturn them. We have to outfox them. And at a certain point, they just keep on getting smarter and smarter. Uh, and in this episode, uh, Lou Diamond Phillips and the seed ship catch up to us and save our cookies uh, from, from one of these, monstrosities uh and uh we go off on another adventure where we're about to uh get ourselves wiped out what did you guys uh feel about the execution and uh, results of resurgence which one of you wrote it <laughs> so you wrote part one right and i wrote part two i think so i think i think, I think so yeah. yeah it's it's funny david because because i'll literally watch these two parters and we always split them up right and our names are on both and i'm like wait a minute yeah i don't this? recall I mean, we would always we would always read each other's you know yeah. uh, scripts and you know I you know offer tweak our, them and uh, stuff insights. like that right yeah. Uh, yeah. but yeah I, it, it, it was a collaborative <laughs> I, I don't remember who came up with the idea for the drones specifically okay. mm -hmm. um, I loved the idea and we had, again it was it was an idea that we had sort of toyed with the idea of of um, an automated some something from a some from a long time ago that somebody just left. And and would click on as soon as it was like, from, you know, from proximity or whatever. Yeah, and then it was just, something. it was just a machine. Like you said, there was no reasoning with it. There was, it was just, uh, this is what it's designed to do. Um, and I, and we loved the idea of a what it looked like a debris field turning into, oh, that's not all debris. Mm -hmm. Those pieces aren't, those pieces aren't debris. That's that was no a very moon. cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was a very cool, uh, yeah. cool sequence. Yeah. The uh, uh, we I think we lose the seed ship uh, in part two. Yeah. The last of of that that race, they 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 give themselves up for for us in a in a last attempt to to take these things out. And it's uh, you guys really ratcheted up this threat throughout the rest of the season. We had already have um, was Twin Destinies had that already come out at that point? No, that was that it was followed next, after Deliverance. It was that, yeah, that's right. The second half, I'm going to say it right here, of the, of SGU season two was some of the best science fiction ever, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. We get show... a lot of that. We get a lot of that, and it's kind of sad. Where you know, it's it's one of the things <laughs> yes! that I hear all the time. People either say they love the show, or you know, they they couldn't get on board the first season, but then in the second season, especially at the end, it got so good, and then it was canceled. It yeah. was. Uh, the the idea that you know a time travel twist seeds a whole civilization of people 
Mm. And, you know, it was one of those things that I was like, you know, oh, had there been a third season, I would have loved to have watched a season of this. And then at the end of the season, we were potentially going to skip over the whole, who knows what was going to happen. But the idea was, right. you know, potentially the, the idea that's left for us to see is skipping over that for, for something else. Um, whose idea was right. it to, to do this twist that sets off the journey for the second half of the year? I, 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 I you mean the drones it, specifically the, or no, the, the descendants of destiny. Oh, that, oh, the twi twin destinies. Yes. That, that, that actually came about, I think from an idea Paul had that we incorporated into the Stargate Atlantis movie that we never got to produce. Do you remember that Stargate I Extinction yeah. where, where yeah. on their way back to Pegasus, the, um, the city of Atlantis encounters some problems with the wormhole drive and ends up stuck in the, what was it, the Triangulum uh, Galaxy? <laughs> Something in the local and, group, I'm sure. And yeah. they end up encountering a civilization where they encounter essentially a, a descendant of, of Taylor hmm. along with a future oh, yeah, version of right. Todd. <laughs> that's yeah. right. I forgot about and that. And so <laughs> we, when we were, and, and that, that you know, we, we wrote that script and it just sat on the shelf for so long. Mm -hmm. And then when we were discussing the back half of season season two, you know, we talked about doing this. And remember, Paul, you said, okay, but if we do this, that we're means not, that the Atlantis, we're not doing the Atlantis, we're not doing yeah. the Atlantis uh, script. Right. And, and, uh, by that point, it was it was pretty evident that we were not going to do the Atlantis uh, movie. Sadly, so Extinction so. took one for the team and and yeah. Yeah. kind of gave its idea to season yeah. two. Yeah. Well, that was that was a, a that was well worth it. So it's it's a it's a great uh, way to finish off uh, the second half of the year. Great way to introduce more uh, characters uh, to yeah. the show. And uh, some great, great performances, especially as as we move forward here. The Hunt uh, showcases um, more of Jamil, and mm -hmm. uh, I believe Jamil Smith and uh, if I, Mike Dopood, yeah, like, uh, who's mm -hmm. coming Mike's, to Mike's his own as Varro. Mm -hmm. What a great so guest this was, star! This was Joe's episode, but I want to say one thing about it right off the bat. First of all, I, it scared the crap out of me because. This was a C this was a CGA monster show, and I think we you had guys, done one before. Yeah, you guys mentioned the uh, oh, the bear, the, the bear in the, uh -huh. in the last episode. Yeah, so this could have been the bear part two, right? Right. So this is uh, I was like, beyond are, are we sure? <laughs> are we sure we want to do this? Uh, so what do you think, Joe? How did it turn out for you? What, you know, it, your... it turned out well, but I mean, when you're writing an episode like this, you're always mindful of, you know. You, you know, you're you're seeing a lot of creature POV, um, yeah. a lot of quick, movement. Quick of, of it moving, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Running in the foreground. <laughs> yeah, and then you sort of build towards that reveal. And, you know, I think Mark Savella and the visual effects team did, did an excellent job. And, and I mean, the reason, one of the, the reasons I, I kind of really like this episode um, is just for the performances of, of Jamil and, yeah. and Mike. And they're two yeah. actors that I love to work with, two two fantastic performers and I just love their character. So it was great to, you know, give them something, something meaty. There's also the, uh, the thing that I, I mean, I know the, the monster is the monster and, but what I remember are the character moments and the other great character moments in this episode, there's two that really stand out for me and they're both Volker. One <laughs> is when he's, one is when he's trying to chat up park in the infirmary. And what was the other guy's name? Was it Morrison? There's a oh, guy yeah. in the next bed <laughs> who keeps interrupting him. Yeah, it's that scene is a is a classic Malazzi scene yeah. where he's he, like he's like a cracked rib. I should be so lucky. I've got a broken <laughs> ankle. And, and and Volker's like, is there talking to Park? Is like, is there anything else I can do? I was like, yeah. Can you take my sock off? My foot's swelling up. That's a great. That is a classic <laughs> Malazzi scene. That but but that character. I think we drew our inspiration from fellow writer Carl Binder. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I think I called him Carl. The, the curmudgeonly guy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's another moment at the end where he goes to the infirmary and has his heart, I'm talking about Volker, yeah. has his heart ripped out of his chest because uh, uh, Park, uh, not um, Jen, 
or getting yeah. all the names. I'm yeah. getting actors and and uh, yeah. uh, Jennifer Spence's character <laughs> uh, is now with with um, yes with somebody else. And uh, and once again, because I think you and you even had him holding flowers. <laughs> like oh my god, <laughs> it was like oh how mean. And of course, Patrick is such a great actor. Yeah. Just the heartbreak is like right there on his face. Um, and you Love, did the same exciting thing. Exciting and new. Because <laughs> I believe you also wrote the scene where Eli had his heart ripped out. Yes. By Chloe when she said, You're, you're, a, you're a really good friend. friend. Right. <laughs> I mean, I I think you wrote that, that too. Yeah. Finale so, of season one. That's possible. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah I guess so I you did, like yeah. to, you know, take the nerdy yeah. male characters <laughs> and they don't get the girl. The hunky military guy gets the girl instead. <laughs> This is reality, yeah. unlike this when Martin Garrow writes a script <laughs> and, uh, and and Nerdy McKay lands uh, the beautiful uh, Jennifer Keller. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> well, I, it's one of those great scenes, uh, I, and I made a meme out of it at the end of, of season one, where it's, you this, the, you see the look on, on David, on Eli's face, is like, squarely in the friend zone. <laughs> It's a That's good thing because yeah. because her response is great when she says, "You look at me like I just gave you second prize, yeah, or something like that." I don't remember yeah. the exact line, and and you kind of get her point of view of it a little bit too. Yeah. It's not just strictly from his point of view. It's a great scene, but he does rip his heart out, and he did it do it. He did it to Volker as well, and and he it was it feels unnecessary. I don't know. It's <laughs> like come on, mm. <laughs> it's a great moment, gentlemen. We come to the end of of quite the run with. Gauntlet. Mm -hmm. um, this this was a true co oof. collab. I mean, I say we you know we we would often write uh, separately, and then we would kind of do passes on each other's scripts. But this is one of those scripts where it was kind of old school, where you know yeah. I'd write a few pages, then he'd rewrite my pages, and then you know forge ahead and write some original pages, and I'd rewrite and then forge ahead. And we'd pitch them back and forth. Oh, you'd rewrite and, while going. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and the one thing I remember about this episode, and I said I mentioned it maybe in the last episode or I mentioned it, it quite often, is we weren't sure if we were coming back or not right. when we were editing this episode. And then you came up with the idea. You're like, you know what? Just in case, what we should do, we should bookend this potential you right. know, season end With the opening shot, yeah. Yeah, so in the opening shot of the, of the pilot, you have us rising up through mm -hmm. the various levels of destiny with the lights turning on the ship turning on and so we just use that in reverse with you know accompanied by joel goldsmith beautiful score i think his best and, piece of music he did yeah in my opinion yeah and yeah, then that I, shot of the destiny always like gets me in that final shot where basically it jumps into fdl and it's continuing behind. and we're left behind yeah yeah, yeah pretty much yeah uh, uh, I, that that was a great. That, he's right. He's right. That was a true collaboration, and it was a great script. I'm so proud of that episode, and it and it was like I talked before about the problem of writing an ending when you don't know whether you're coming back or not. Right? You don't want to cheat the audience, and but you want to, you know, do something exciting and cool. See, I don't. I, I mean, you. I read something where you described it as a cliffhanger, Joe, and and I was like, I don't really consider that to be a cliff cliffhanger. It, it it's. It's a good, it, it delivers because it's an ending, but also mm -hmm. possibly not an ending, which it had to be. And that was hard to do. Yeah. And um, you mentioned Joel. I want to I want to say the same thing. Like, I I didn't get a lot of chances to work with Joel. Brad mm -hmm. did most of the music uh, of, throughout the whole franchise. He was the one who talked to Joel the most. But for this episode, for that ending piece, I spoke to him and... Um, uh, just, I just, I, you know, it's, I, I'm not a musician, so it's very hard for me to sort of speak in musical terms, but I right. tried to convey to him what we were after. And obviously the, the, the film itself shows what, what, what's, you know, what's needed. And he just freaking nailed it. It was so good. Brad, <laughs> it was so good. Brad, Brad told me, he said uh, he had, uh, uh, Joel had called him and Joel uh, said, I want you to, hear what i have and he, he played the music for him and brad said i've got tears in my eyes yeah I mean, it, it was is fantastic a fantastic piece of music i miss joel so much yeah. i was so lucky that we got to know each other a little bit but i mean man that guy what a mm. rock star he yeah he's so much responsible for so much of the soul yeah. of the franchise yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. I was going back. I told you before. I was going back and watched in preparation for this. I was watching episodes, and um, he has a rec- there's a recurring theme that he used that we reused in sort of quiet, sad moments. It's it, he played it um, in the the end of the two parter when um, when Chloe is being sent off to the aliens and she's having that last moment uh, with Scott, and that 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 is playing in the background. And then I saw it in other episodes, and it just it's so haunting and so beautiful. Like there was just so many of those. Uh, uh, throughout this show, well, I mean the whole franchise, but mm-hmm. but you know we're talking about SGU, and and it was just, yeah, amazing. There is a Thanksgiving scene, essentially, in this oh, yeah, episode, the, the, the meal, yeah, which is kind of like I mean it's 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 one part Last Supper, yeah, it's <clears throat> it's uh, that 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 yeah. scene encapsulates for me what makes truly great sci-fi or what really to me makes truly great sci-fi whether it's you know the the crew of the enterprise or sg1 heading through the gate or 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 the atlantis expedition or the crew of the destiny ultimately i think sci-fi is always about family and you know i kind of you know kind of press that point home in that that particular scene this one fought like cats and dogs to earn that scene though i mean mm -hmm, they were at each other's throats yeah and then this was earned which is why yeah. I love it so much. Yeah, I read in your, you know, in, on on uh, gate uh, on the on the website uh, in the notes, you're you're often quoted because of your blog, and and you said that it was Erica's idea that originally Erica yeah. Kinnear was was a was a sci-fi executive. Uh, originally, it was just a shot of them having a meal in a montage, mm. Mm. and then I had forgotten this. But and then she said, "No, I, I want to hear them. I want to hear them talking. I want to. I want to sing." So wow. credit her. Credit her for yeah. that because yeah, that was her idea, and thank God we did that. Yeah, how cool is that? Yeah. Um, it, it, Joe, any final uh, uh, thoughts on on rounding out that that particular episode and you know this this whole adventure? No, I mean, like I said, we at the time I think we were. I, under the impression that we might get a third and final season. Mm-hmm. And that was what was being talked about. Uh, and so when we produced this episode, we didn't really know whether we were coming back or not. And you know, sadly, we didn't come back. And uh, in the end, that was that. Um, I think, you know, you, you know, usually what we would do is we would wrap. And then once the season had wrapped, the writers would get together, what, like a couple of weeks later, and we'd start breaking for the following for the following season. And um, I don't, I don't remember. I, 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 we found out we were canceled. Um, I mean, I found out at the office, but apparently, Brad and a lot of the cast were. What were they? The USS were Carl they, Vinson. They were. At, they yeah. were at sea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. When, and yeah. Twitter, I so think, broke get... the news or something. It was one of those mm-hmm. early things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember how much we talked about season three. Like, no, we, we did. Bring... We didn't. Unlike unlike season six, where we had that kind of half ass uh, idea board uh, right. on the whiteboard, we did not discuss season three. We, you know, I mean, there we we you know, you know, in hindsight, we can talk about the potential ways it could have gone, but we never had the opportunity to actually sit down and right. strategize. Right. right. I also don't remember when we introduced the 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 stasis pods mm-hmm. did we know we were going to do that ending when we do, when we hmm. developed them we or did we... the stasis pods or when did we find them? it was a couple of episodes before it was that was it it, just yeah. blockade uh was it, it before, was before that it was i think it might was it blockade i think it had to have been earlier because because I remember that there was a whole sequence where they were farting around and then they got rushed, frozen, like lo- yeah. lock, locked Brody yeah. in <laughs> and all that stuff. Uh, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. But yeah. but in the end, it it provided an uh, just a really kind of sad but moving mm-hmm. way of sort of sending <laughs> sending them off into the universe, not killing them. No, right? well dead. maybe Eli, but we don't know. But 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 it's yeah maybe Eli, but. Um, <laughs> But it just it works so well because because they're not dead, but they're also not going and they're not continuing to have adventures that we don't get to see, right? Like they're out there, but they're frozen. <laughs> so, yeah. So they're just kind of like ah, and then and as then, Elena said, never aging. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So that in theory, a hundred years from now, there could be, you know, obviously not because the actors, well, they'd be they'd be CG at that point, I guess. But uh, uh, but from a, from a sort of an audience standpoint, it's mm -hmm. like because if because if we if we just left said okay, they're going to keep going, and you just don't get to see it. That's kind of rude, uh, but also blowing up the ship is kind of rude too. So it's like, yeah, I think it was it was, it was the best we <laughs> it's could do. A fair was, compromise, yeah. Right. And and but frankly, you know, if any show could come back, uh, that, that it's, we had set up a, a finale that would allow us to come back, it would be yeah, Stargate exactly. Universe. I mean, exactly. Twenty years later, you know, the those. Uh, those paws kind of malfunction, so maybe some of them yeah. look a little order, some of them didn't make it. In my right. mind, like I look, I look yeah. back and I compare the endings, right? The endings mm -hmm. of SG One and Atlantis and, yeah. and Universe, and they all were kind of cool in their own way. They were all right. endings, right? So mm -hmm. none, none of it's good in that sense. But I mean, SG One, ten seasons. What are you, what are you going to do? Like nobody, uh, nobody was movies. complaining at that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but that that felt like a really yeah. appropriate ending, and and Atlantis too could have kept going. I mean, there was nothing, there was nothing ending in that sense about that that last scene. But it felt like it still delivered that moment where they were all together and, uh, you know, looking out at at the Golden Gate Bridge, like it just you have to do something like that to have some sense of closure. Otherwise, it's just so annoying to just be left hanging. Uh, but you don't want to just completely wrap it up because there's always the possibility that you come back, right? So it's a tricky thing, but I think we've done some pretty good versions of that. Absolutely. So this is the first that I heard that um, it's possible that the pods were not created to be the element that ended the show. That I don't just, remember, in... to be oh, honest. Okay. I, I, I don't. don't remember if we okay. said, we need stasis pods for the ending of the show, right, or, if okay. we, or if it was like, well, we got these stasis pods, why don't we use those? That's the way it goes on Stargate, right? Like, like. Yeah. There was just so many, so many years of just so many elements, and and we, we had to like kind of almost have a catalog in your mind and be like, yeah. oh, we're pitching a story, and it's like, how do we get out of this one? And it was like, well, remember that planet we went to? That guy was there. He had that thing. Why don't we bring that back? <laughs> because that could get us out of this particular problem. Um, so you know, going back and trying to remember how, the order of things and how it was all planned, it it seems like it was all planned out, but I I don't know how random it was at the time. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Although that was a tricky element of SU in general, right? Because we couldn't bring new things on the ship very easily. Nice. We really had to like set stuff up, you know. Dial uh, Pittsburgh and, and go and get it, some it, new outfits. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was why that was one of the reasons why that whole civilization was a great idea. It was like, oh, we can have people and we can have other stuff that right. looks familiar and yeah. Beef jerky or something yeah. like it. <laughs> Beef jerky <laughs> survives, yeah, that's right. <laughs> And that music in the elevator. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. That's well that 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 episode, I mean, that's Carl that's Carl Binder at his absolute finest. That what yes. was it called again? Just Epilogue common, and common descent. Ep, mm. Epilogue, yeah. Some of my favorites. I mean I mean that is a classic Carl Binder episode mm. if, you, if if ever you wanted to see one. Uh, he was always the mushy guy, right? Like Carl was the mushy guy and, and you know, all the babies being born and everything like that's all classic binder. And it, it was such a great episode. I have uh, a few questions from fans, if you guys wouldn't mind sticking around and answering. Yeah, sure. Uh, and Joe, I will let you delegate. General Maximus, this is just just uh, uh, a remark here. This is my first live Dial the Gate, and I would like to take advantage of the opportunity to say a very genuine and sincere thank you for all the stories and adventures you have given us and the journeys we have been on with the characters. I watched SG-1 from day one when it originally aired, and it isn't a coincidence wow. that after all these years and despite the influx of streaming and new content, Stargate continues to be one of the best TV shows ever made. Wow. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh, William Ahrens, uh, was it ever stated or in your mind how far into the universe or to what other galaxies that Destiny and her crew had traveled? Um, I don't know if we got specific. I think it was, we were kind of like three quarters or something like that of the way through. Out to the edge to, or to the edge, whatever. The edge, something like that. It was past halfway, I, okay. I believe. I believe. I, I don't remember. I mean, the un how do you even... You know, right the unit right like yeah it's the you count it in billions of light years right and we we would just say billions of light years from home we never said eight billion light year, years right. i don't think they Several actually billion knew. is the line i'm not sure if they yeah. knew they they had that course and they mm -hmm. in the beginning and you watched it going and they're like are those stars it's like no those are galaxies that, you know that was a great scene um 
but I don't know how specific we ever got in our own minds. I, I don't really remember. It was just billions and billions. Did you, I'm curious, did, did the, the, the possibility of, of a loop like yeah. of, of space bending occur in the conversations yeah. that you were actually we talked about that. Okay. I talked about that with Brad because I didn't exactly know what Brad had in mind for the ending. And we talked about the, the background radiation and stuff like that. But in my mind, there was always a possibility that they would come back to earth, but it would be like a million years in the future or a million years in the past. Yeah. The long way like around. The, yeah, yeah. There would be some weird time effect to it or something, but you know, it's that classic. If you, if you walk on a balloon and eventually you get back to the, to the starting point. And the balloon enough, is right? expanding or contracting as the, yeah, as the exactly. does. Exactly. So. so we did talk about that, but we never got far enough into the discussion to really iron out what what it would be if we if we wound up doing that. Hilda Bowen, did you guys ever play Dungeons and Dragons with David Blue? He's a D and D player. <laughs> no, that was about uh, our Dungeons and Dragons was uh, well before Stargate time. Yeah, we got a, a lot of our uh, system by the time. We, uh, yeah. <laughs> Have I, uh, Jack uh, Hyder, uh, have either of you played the the uh, new SG One role playing game? Uh, believe it or I not, have... I haven't. I can't speak okay. for Paul. I have not. It's sweet, guys. <laughs> I have not. You need to check it out. It's really cool. Okay. Um, George Fotis Dramasoitis. Are there any props that you got to keep? Well. I'm Speaking... glad you brought that up. Yes. Yeah. Because I'm actually wearing one. Whether well, it's <laughs> technically not a prop. This is, this is a costume, not a prop. Uh, I have to lift it up and point because I'm backwards here. Ex Deus so, Machina, I believe. So this is the ball symbol, of course. Everyone out there will recognize this. Uh, and he actually wore mm -hmm. a shirt like this in the episode, Cliff Simon, um, uh, one of our favorites, uh, yes. um, who sadly died last year. So yes. this is for you, Cliff. Uh, yeah. Um, I, saw the, I saw the dailies. I saw him wearing this. And I went to the costume department and said, I need one of those. That's the <laughs> coolest thing I've ever seen. And so they gave me one and they you, made me one. Didn't you get to keep a ZPM? No, I had one in my office for the longest time. Uh, it, had, it was actually broken. It, it, like a little mm. corner of it had broken off. And then somebody took it. I don't even remember what happened. I think somebody at some point was like, you can't have that anymore. And then they took it away from me. I don't. I probably I don't, sold I who, who would tell you you can't I have that? I don't remember. I don't remember. It was, it was, uh, I never got to take it home. There was, a, we, PropWorks got, I think three ZPMs. And one of them was in a a the gray crate that I think uh, Ryan Robbins has in in coup d'état, and one of them because they were made of this one was made of candy glass, and right. like every yeah. time I touched it, a piece of the end, <laughs> yeah, like chipped off, and it yeah, was like no, okay, was... no one touched this thing, we're done. No, mine was very solid, okay. and and it was in two pieces, and the little. P part of the top had been not it had fallen down and knocked so that's why they gave it to me like, this one's broken you can have it and then i don't know i don't remember what happened to it but uh, yeah sadly what do you about you buddy do you have any props i uh i got to keep the a couple of the rubber bugs from the episode of the scourge oh yeah sg1 R75. Uh, i actually kept a prop from our very first episode scorched earth it's a, an alien petri dish that was in low uh, uh, yes. no, low tan ship and yep. uh, uh, I had a pain stick, but I gave it away uh, if, uh, during a fan giveaway a couple of years a ago. Pain so. stick. Oh, right. At the, yeah, yeah, the pain stick. Yeah, Did yeah, you yeah. give that I, one I, to Jenny? Because I have it. I <laughs> there was one that was know. using I... Continuum. And I, I, I have oh. it over here. Well, maybe oh, he that's does it. have a pain stick. It's right behind yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> that's it then, maybe. Yeah. I forget who, who won it. So for Stargate Continuum, um, this was one of the, the giveaways uh, mm -hmm. at a convention and I saw that thing and I was like, Ooh, I'm paying for that one. And, uh, I thought, I think cool. people were scared to outbid me. I, I felt really oh, yeah. bad because I only got <laughs> yeah. it for like 200 bucks. Oh, David what? wants it. Nobody, nobody. Yeah. David. I know David that <laughs> I felt bad. I was like, this is, this I, is a steal. You know so. what, what, what we, Joe, Joe had in his office for a long time. I don't know if he ever told you this story. Um, it wasn't a prop. It was a piece of, uh, the art department. It was, it was a blueprint of uh, uh, the set from- um, Window of Opportunity. Window of Opportunity, right? One of our first episodes. Yeah, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and he had it on his wall, but I don't know if you know that blueprints, if they're exposed to light, they maybe they don't anymore, but at that time they fade, okay? So it was on his wall for years and it just kept fading and fading and fading. But the, we look at it and we're like, 
as long as it as long as it doesn't disappear completely, we'll keep making the show. Like it was, <laughs> it was what was keeping the show alive all that time. It was like the picture of Dorian Gray in reverse. It was like it's like as long as that and it was getting really faint. I was like, you can't take it down. It's it's the only thing keeping us going. As soon as that thing disappears, we're done. Then eventually he got yeah. a new office. He got his office expanded and he got rid of it. Yeah. Like what an asshole. But anyway, <laughs> which was I think the final season. Was it brought it upon yeah. us? Yeah. yeah. Uh, popcorn power. Many bad shows I see simply regurgitate what they have seen on other shows. How important do you think very life experiences of writers are to the quality of stories? Uh, good question. You answer that one, buddy. Uh, that's a really tough one for me to answer. I don't know about life experiences. I mean, mm. especially when you know you. You can't help but, you know, convey experience in 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 your writing. So you know whether you're you know writing a a you know a grounded drama or something, you know, like a like a Stargate universe where mm. you're out in you know you know in space. Um, you know, I I don't know. It's a tough it's a tough one to answer, I guess. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I think Joe's right. You always, you're always, consciously or not, you're always going to bring, you know, your own experience to something. But we are out in space. I mean, that the, the the thing about science fiction is, you're in space or wherever in in the past or wherever you are in some kind of science fiction uh, setting, but you're still dealing with human beings, right? So so you know, obviously they have to be relatable. So you're going to draw from your own experience of how people interact with each other right to to write this stuff uh but I, I it's very hard to sort of say specifically like it's mm -hmm. not like i wrote scenes that that were things that actually happened to me you know maybe certain jokes and and stuff like that yeah maybe we would have done stuff like that but otherwise it's just more it's a more a process of osmosis right right where it mm -hmm. just kind of it just kind of happens organically uh, Akos, uh, Thomas Navaki, which of your own storyline, character, race, or planet would, uh, would you not mind seeing revisited again in a future spinoff? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I've always said I've been, I'm a big fan of Richard Wolsey. I'm a big fan yeah. of, uh, Bob Picardo. So in terms of, uh, characters, he was always a, uh, a blast, which is kind of, you know, when you think of sort of the vastness of the Stargate franchise, there's a lot of, uh, elements yeah, I, that I'd want to revisit, but. I just had the most fun working with him and writing his character. Absolutely. Uh, you? Let's... Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. There's too there's too much out there. <laughs> Woolsey is a good answer. He, uh, I love Bob Picardo, but <laughs> but yeah, I, I it's, you know I don't I, I, all of it. <laughs> uh, Teresa Mc <laughs> Teresa McQuestion, Paul and or Joseph. Hey, are there episodes you wish you could go back and tweak? Huh. Mm. And as to you specifically, I don't think so. I think this uh, is more general. Yeah, eh. I'd have to. I'd have to go back and sort of like revisit and and sort of look at. It, it, it was mostly probably like technical stuff, like you know visual effects, like like the bear. Oh, the bear wasn't our episode, but mm -hmm. things that 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 we got better at over yeah. time that we couldn't maybe maybe do quite so well the first time around, but. But you don't, you can't dwell on that kind of stuff, right. right? We were always moving forward. We weren't worrying about, well, that episode didn't turn out quite as well as we wanted it to. Maybe, you know, if, so, and, and there's all kinds of production limitations that come in that maybe make something a little bit disappointing. Weird stuff like just, why, how did they, why did they block that scene like that? He shouldn't yeah. come in from that. Like it fucked everything. I'm sorry. It, it, it messed everything up. Uh, but yeah, you, you can't, I, I, I didn't hold those things in my head. Joe, is that fair? Yeah, that is fair. Okay. Uh, time profits. Any news on the dark matter pitch? Uh, no, no. Basically, um, you know, I uh, Jay basically said he'd be interested in doing a mini series, and okay. um, you know, I don't know. I, I leave it in I leave it in Jay's hands because he's the one who would have to set up a uh, a uh, a dark matter mini series since. Uh, Paul and I don't own the rights. It's uh, in the hands of uh, Prodigy Pictures. So okay. until I hear from Jay, I know nothing. Okay. 
Uh, Mark B, uh, no question, I just wanted to say a fantastic job in all of Stargate and Dark Matter. It got me through a tough time when I had a motorcycle accident. I couldn't walk for three months. Oh, wow. So oh, those geez. were my lifelines. Wow. I'm you know, the, <laughs> the show, really, like, Summer is a is a perfect example, you know. I mean, she's the only person I know who is prescribed. I don't know if you can hear me, Summer. Are you there? No, she's she's watching the live feed. Uh, I'm she's, here. There she is. <laughs> she's the only person I know who has subscri- uh, prescribed Stargate uh, by her doctor. Isn't that right, Summer? Yes. That's absolutely correct. I've had over really? 35 major surgeries in my life. So wow. they they noticed oh that uh, every time Stargate would come on, my blood pressure would go back to normal. So my doctor said, you must watch Stargate every day. Wow. <laughs> like, okay, I can totally do that. <laughs> it's not a problem. But I mean, it's it's things like that where, you know, you have to remember that. I mean, obviously, you're you're going in, you're putting out some piece of entertainment. The entertainment is really hitting some people where they need to mm-hmm. be, you know, where 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 they need this stuff. So it's it's overwhelming. Definitely, definitely. Well, um, again, I'm glad, glad we could help. <laughs> <laughs> Regal Giants, do you guys consider the Stargate comics canon? I've <laughs> never read the okay. Stargate comics. Okay. We, I, I mean, with... I always say that the, you know, when, when fans ask, "Is it canon?" I will say, "Sure, you can consider it canon." you know until the point where essentially we we launch a new series uh, at that point they probably cease being canon depending on you know what what uh because i mean you know what you know i don't know what brad ultimately has in mind for like a new series but if it's set in the existing stargate universe then he'll probably touch on aspects of previous incarnations of the show and he's certainly not going to be beholden to and he's kind of spin off merchandise. Oh, absolutely. That, uh, you know, that was created after the uh, the end of Stargate I, Universe. I, I always consider it's, it's canon until something bumps it. Right. So that's how I look at it. Uh, the one with the many Zs, was the character of Gen created for season two of Universe or had you planned to introduce her at the end of season one? It felt odd to suddenly have her there uh, in season two without having seen her in Incursion. Sorry, who? Uh, Gin. Gin. I, yeah. That was a bit of a cheat. That was a little bit of a cheat. Uh, again, I said I mentioned this before, because when you bring stuff on the Destiny, it's like, okay, we got a new group of people. Well, have enough of them so you can't see all the faces, <laughs> so right. that it's not crazy when when you know suddenly that one of them becomes a character that we see and talk to, and uh, uh, it, it was a little. She was not physically there when they came on the ship in, at, at the end of season one uh the actress so, but the character the was mm-hmm. yeah she just did yeah. i mean y- y- kiva but, exited which gave room for her to come in so yeah yeah, yeah. The, the 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 really cool one with that for me was robert nepper because he he yeah. we, you can't just suddenly have robert nepper appear out of a group of people like mm-hmm. like he got layered in uh, which was quite good, and uh, and and it was weird because it was like, hey, that's Robert Nepper. Why isn't he doing anything in this episode? <laughs> He's just there. It's like he was like a ticking time bomb waiting to that's go off. Right. It was like at some point this guy's gonna blow and do something horrible because it's Robert Nepper. You know he's good, but but he was a good example of like we had to. You can't just pop because it's Robert Nepper. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, him in, but yeah, she was a bit of a cheat, I think, because she was not there amongst the original crowd. I, I got to assume she wasn't. Right. No, well, yeah. And, you know, and you guys did something similar. I'm trying. I'm forgetting the name. That the chat will 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 uh, correct me. But uh, there was a there was a, uh, an Air Force officer in in season one who was on medication, and so he was kind of a ticking time bomb as well. And then in, right. in I think it's Justice, he offs yeah. himself. Yeah. You know, yeah. rather yeah. than rather than harming anyone else. And so this season, so you guys, Walker. yes, yeah. you guys, this season were not messing around. It's like this yeah. guy. Mm. And it, yeah, well, Simeon's one of the great villains of of the franchise. As but we as had that we had that discussion with Brad and Rod. That was another thing that was baked into the concept. It was like, okay, there's only so many people, so yeah. you can't just suddenly have new. So so the idea was, okay, let's have a large group of people and not yeah. really just mm-hmm. see all the faces. Right. So that it was at least believable when you know a, a soldier or somebody in six or seven episodes later could become a character, you know, uh, that we hadn't necessarily met right from the beginning. Um, uh, but there, you were only a bit, you could only do that a little bit, like right? You exactly. You couldn't push it too far. Lock watcher, uh, how did French Stewart react to coming back to Stargate? Did anyone have that know. conversation with him? I did not. 
I did not. That, that wasn't our episode, was it? No. Uh, See, this is the I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the not. truth was we were all a mini showrunners to a certain respect. Mm. We all, you know, we wrote our individual episodes. We ran our individual episodes. Um, we produced our individual episodes. And because we were focused on our, our episodes, we didn't really get a chance to interact with, you know, much of yeah. other people's I think production. He, I think he came up to the office and we met him and said hi, but I didn't have okay. a conversation with him. Yeah. Okay. William Ahrens, um, this this is more of a Brad question, but I'm I'm curious as as to your guys' thoughts. Had SGU conti- continued, how do you think Rush would have uh, evolved as a character? Would he have continued to remain a self centered egomaniac, or would that have been kind of like how Rodney evolved? That would have like continued to be part of his personality, but he would have continued to be more along the alignment of of the military and the other characters. No, As I don't we think saw would... beginning to happen in Twin Destinies. Yeah, he, you know, we, like, he got sort of humanized a little mm-hmm. bit over the course of the show. He softened a little bit, but he was, he was never, that core part of him was never going to go away. And and mm-hmm. it was, and it was always fun to do that. Like, like when he saves Chloe, right? It's like, and and Ray says, if I didn't know any better, I'd say you put you know one individual over the and he says it's the problem. That's the problem. You don't know any better, right? Like he mm-hmm. he's still an asshole, yeah, right. Like like even when he does nice things, there's always an a possible ulterior motive to it. Like did he do that for their sake, or is it just something that he needed to do and he he sort of made it look like he did it for somebody else's sake? So I don't he he was he was softening a little bit, but I don't think it ever would have gone to the point where he's like he was a fuzzy warm and fuzzy guy no. he was always going to be that guy yeah which would have been fun it would have been great to see that character continue to go because it was amazing i loved what i loved that about him i loved that we could do stuff like and he just had that look like he always just was like wait what is he thinking like did he did he mean what he just said like he just always had that element to him and and it was fun to, to watch that Barry, Barry, uh, I always wanted to know where, if there were any scenes where the actor went way off script, and it was so funny, you guys, in, in the dailies, you guys managed to keep it in. I can't remember an example. Rick yeah, was notorious so for much, this. Not so much in Stargate Universe. Okay. I mean, SG-1. Yeah. Rick oh, yeah. Well, notorious Rick, Rick for... the, the, the script was just a guideline for Rick. He never knew <laughs> what he was going to say. So, yeah. in fact, in fact, he would go out of his way to say something different. Like, if you wrote hello, he would say hi. <laughs> if you wrote hi, he would say hello. Like, he he had to do it. It was like, that <laughs> but, but yeah, and he also had lib. He did a lot of funny stuff, too, that that, that stayed in. So, uh, but um, yeah, no, not SDU was too. Uh, there wasn't. A, I mean, let's face it, there was some humor, mm-hmm. but uh, it was pretty intense. So it, it, it was it, we stuck to the script pretty much. Multiple people in the chat loving the vibe between Paul and Joe. Paul, will you please come back to dial the gate? Sure. Yes! <laughs> you know what? You know what he should do? He should go back to season four of SG1. You're jumping and go ahead, through, Joe. So you can sort of catch up with me. So I wasn't, I mean, I I wanted to see, you know, how much he enjoyed our show. And because, like, having him one-on-one with me, sorry, Paul, I know you're in the room, um, will be, That's right. like, a little bit of a different vibe. But, I mean, mm-hmm. Rob Cooper and I are doing seven episodes now, so I, I think we can make it work, so. Yeah, but we're, we're like a comedy duo, right? Like, you know, <laughs> you need... You need to cut back and forth. Absolutely, Paul. My my hope is that you and I can go back with the material, but we won't. We'll, we'll, I think we'll be a little bit more aggressive with the the time frame. I won't take as long with you. I, you've got your family and everything going on, so. But I would love to have you back. Well, listen. I I want to say thank you for having me because I told you guys before we started this that I when I watched your last episode, I was scared because I was like, I don't remember anything. This is horrible. I'm not. I'm going to be really bad yeah. at this. So I went back and watched it. I watched the show again. Not. I didn't watch all 40 episodes because that was a bit much in a week, but uh, I, I did watch quite a few, and it was fantastic. I did. I was so glad to, you know, I 12 years in my life and kids and everything, and I had forgotten a lot, or not forgotten, but just sort of put it aside. Right. You know, um, and not thought about it for a long time, and and preparing for this i went back and then and i'm really glad i did stuff like like we talked about joel's music i was like oh i remember this this is so awesome like and just moments on set and and stuff like that uh, I, it was very i'm glad i did it because I, I 
was, was, a, and, was a cool and thing. And the truth me. is, as writer producers, we rarely actually watch finished episodes because we're watching dailies, we're watching uh, director's cuts, we're in editing, uh, watching and re-watching the episodes, and then we're watching them again during the mixes. So you're watching you know, them for a reason. You're yes, watching them yes. for a production reason. Like even the mix, which is, you, you know, you, everything's locked visually and some of the visual effects might be done, or maybe, but you're still, you're still not watching it just to enjoy it. You're, you're yeah. working on it. Yeah, right? yeah. And so, and then you move on because, because we're making more episodes, more episodes. You don't go back. So years can go by, like right. in my case, and then you go back and you go, this was a good show. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what, I, that's what happened to me. I rewatched it and I just was appreciated it all over again. I, I, I rewatched like a couple of years ago when Kenny asked me to watch and I thought, oh, she's being nice. And so maybe we'll watch the first episode or two and then she'll get bored and we'll do something else. But she was totally on board. Yeah. She absolutely loved the show, which just surprised me uh, so much so that she was like incredibly disappointed uh, that it only had two seasons. <laughs> Join the club, Kimmy. Join the club. Jeez. Andrew P., what was it like to kill off Telford by electrocuting him? <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't there on set yeah. when that happened, yeah. but I, we almost killed him. We choked him. Yeah, uh, that's right. That was right. an episode, and I was on set for that, and I was blown away by that. It, the, the, unfortunately, the, the the electrocution, he just kind of froze, which was yeah. cool. And that shot of his and eye. And it's appropriate. That was, yes. It yeah. was really cool. But um, but for me, when I saw him choking to death and That's playing right. that, yeah. that performance was incredible. I was like, is he really holding it? Like, <laughs> it, it, it looked like he was choking to death. Yeah. <laughs> so like, he's turning or, beet red. He wasn't, yeah. I guess, what's, what's the term? He wasn't choking. He was dying of asphyxiation. Yeah. 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 Uh, Blue Diamond felt, yeah. man, he was run through the ringer, man. Mm. Uh, <laughs> when you think about it, holy cow. so great. He was so great to have on the show. He's such a great guy, and he's such a professional, and he's he's just easy to be with, and he just comes in. He's like, where do you, you, know, where do you want me to stand? What do you want me to say? There's, right. he, he, and he just gets into it. It, it was great having him. Mm. Raj Luthrop. Paul, uh, if Brad invites you back... Um, if uh, Amazon proceeds with his uh, fourth Stargate series, if if Brad were to invite you back, um, would you would you uh, would you jump at the chance, or would you be like, you know, have to think about it? What's what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I would jump at the chance. Absolutely, great. I would work on first of all, I would work on Stargate again without without hesitation because I loved it so much. And second of all, I would work with Brad again, same reason. Uh, so yeah, no, that would be a no brainer for me. Okay. And a fun one to finish off with. Chaos Knight just dropped this one in. Dream show or franchise from past or present that was uh, for posterity? Do you wish you could have writing credit on outside of Stargate? Oh, Jesus. Uh, that's a good question. Writing credit on. Um, hmm. There's a lot out there. Mm. Get, have a writing credit on. Like, as you not what does that mean? Just the credit yeah, or not I'm having not, the I'm, experience? I'm trying to or... interpret the question here. Um, I, I to would, have been associated with? Yeah. What, what's a show yeah. that you love, that you you know wish that you could have, you know, if you're given a, a wish to go back and sit in on a writing on a writer's room from a show? It, okay. To be honest with you, one show that I, that I absolutely loved, um, you know, I, they're, they're like, I have like five top shows, <laughs> you know, Sopranos, uh, Breaking Bad, right. Rome. Uh, you know, shows that, that are fantastic, but there's always like one thing, you know, in the show that kind of bothered me or didn't work for me. But there was one show that I thought was perfection. Uh, and that was The Shield. The way they used to always kind of paint their characters into corners. And I'm like, there's no way they're going to be able to write their way out. And I would have just been very curious to be in that room to see how far ahead they planned or, or if it was a situation where they had painted themselves into the corner, came back, sat down and was like, okay, now, now what are we going to do? And how they went out, uh, about kind of unraveling. Mm -hmm. oh. Paul? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have one. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the, but like Breaking Bad probably would be up there. I, that, that was a mm -hmm. show that I just completely loved from beginning to end. Um, if, in, in terms of genre, it's a bit trickier. I, I maybe, or maybe the original Buffy. I loved that show. Yeah. I, 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 I could have, would have loved to have been a writer on that show. Although recently stories have come out that said <laughs> that, 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 maybe that, that maybe, you weren't. 
maybe it wasn't so much fun to be a writer on that show, but but in terms of the content, it was yeah, I love that show. I've been rewatching. I, I don't know how YouTube's algorithm works with me, but you know, you you, you watch something and it just keeps feeding you more. I've stumbled sure. upon this Breaking Bad clips channel, and oh. it's uh, it will occasionally serve me up just random clips from the show, and I've I've watched it twice all the way through, and it's like, but it's been years, and I see these clips, it's like. Damn, this is good. I've got to go back and rewatch. I'm yeah. waiting for Better Call Saul to finish, and then I'm going to mow it all down. I've mm, I've not yeah. seen the last few seasons, so there's some, that Vince Gilligan. Man, is yeah. he brilliant? Yeah. yeah. Well, he was he was on uh, the Shield. Oh, okay. Was well, it? yeah. Okay. There you go, gentlemen. Um, it's been a privilege to to take time with you to go through uh, this this material together, Paul. Um, I'll reach out to Joe and see if I can get your information directly. I'd love to schedule time with you in the future to come sure. back. I have a lot of questions for you, and okay. um, I would really enjoy um, stepping through uh, this piece of your life uh, with you over the course of a few shows over, you know, at some point here in, in the future. It would mean a lot. Sure. Okay, so, good. Joe, I, my friend, I, I cannot thank you enough for uh, coming in and taking us uh, step by step through your processes, your episodes, um, your emotional states through these mm-hmm. these <laughs> trials and and uh, discoveries of uh, you know what figuring out what you were made of as a writer. Uh, this is this has been a treat for all of us. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and you know, like I said, it's uh, you know I reached the point many months ago when I said, I, you know, I, I, I'm kind of done with the podcast and the interviews and the and the streamcast, but I always made an exception for this show because it was a different. And I always appreciated the fact that you, David, you were always came in very prepared and made it different and made it very enjoyable. So thank you. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I uh, will be in touch with you both and I appreciate you for coming on. Right? All right. Be well, Take guys. Care. Thank you okay. so much. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Joseph Malazzi and Paul Mully, executive producers for Stargate Universe. It has been a pleasure having them on, and uh, thank you so much for tuning in. We have a great crowd in the chat. Um, before I let you guys go, I just wanted to give a uh, shout out and thanks to my team, uh, Summer and Tracy. Uh, they make the show uh, possible and uh, are continuing to be in there for uh, the the moderating team, uh, as well as Keith, Jeremy, uh, Reese, and Anthony, as well, our moderators. Big thanks to my producer, Linda Gategabber Fury. She continues to promote the show uh, week after week. To Frederick Marcoux at Concepts Web, our web developer on Gut Dial the Gate, and also a big thank you to Jeremy Heiner, our webmaster who keeps uh, the site up to date. We have uh, t shirts available. Uh, just uh, to let you know, we bring you the show every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. But if you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag, T-shirts, as well as tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages, as well as cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors at dialthegate.com merch. You can click on a specific design and see what items are being offered and check out as fast and easy. You can use your credit card or PayPal. Just go to dialthegate.com merch. And thank you so much for your support. We have... Uh, David DeLuise coming up in just a few minutes here. He is going to be uh, uh, joining us. Pete Shanahan from Stargate SG-1. Let me take a look at what's coming your way. Next week, we have uh, on the 7th of May at 12 noon Pacific time, Catherine Powers. I have a pre-recorded episode with her. I went out and visited with her in uh, out in California at her home, and we did a, a pre-recorded show as well as commentaries. We recorded episode commentaries for several of the shows that she wrote. This interview is going to be more of an overview of her life. It's it has a little bit of Stargate content in it, but it really is. She was one of the first women writers in you know in the the sci-fi field for uh uh for hollywood and so we have those conversations with her and she's very frank about some of her experiences in la um and she's going to share uh, uh 
her life with you. And she's one of the more interesting people that you will ever come across. She is a medium and uh, she practices witchcraft. And uh, she wrote for the first uh, few seasons of Stargate SG-1. And sitting down and listening with her was a journey for me because it, 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 I set aside my... I've, I've known her for seven or eight years now, and I've set aside my uh, uh, preconceptions and, you know, just let her tell her story. And so next week she will do that in a pre-recorded interview, which you will find fascinating because it gives you some insight into the Asgard and it gives you some insight into uh, some of the uh, the stories that, that she was weaving at the beginning that were adjusted as the show went along. Then the 14th of May at 12 noon... Stargate Science with Mika McKinnon and David Hewlett. And this is an episode that I am really looking forward to uh, just because these two folks are absolutely uh, amazing. Mika was a science consultant on uh, Atlantis and Universe, and she is a wealth of knowledge about uh, pretty much anything astrophysics related that you can think of. So she's going to be live with David Hewlett and myself the 14th of May at 12 noon Pacific time. That's what we have here. I did see a couple of questions that were dedicated to me. Teresa MC, what area would you like to be involved in? Props, makeup, anything of that such. Um, if I were in production, I would definitely want to be at Evil Kenny's side in the props department and with James Robbins in the, uh, in the, uh, in the production department as they were, you know, bringing these things to life. Um, I would like to also sit in on the writer's room as well. I don't know. That's tough. Uh, Raj Luthra, what were your favorite episodes? <laughs> um, okay, for SG-1, uh, I probably have to say uh, The Fifth Race. For Atlantis, it would have to be Sunday. And for Universe, it would probably have to be a combination of uh, Common Descent and Epilogue. I appreciate you guys tuning in. We had a great crowd in uh, the live chat here. Thank you all for submitting content. Thanks once again to my moderating team. Couldn't do this show without you guys. David DeLuise is joining us in 20 minutes. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. I really appreciate you tuning in. And I will see you guys on the other side. Thanks so much.